Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists and local political leaders about the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Jeremy Roberts. Tonight, we'll look behind these headlines. Montecito residents grow increasingly frustrated with unclear and unreliable evacuation planning. Fierce campaigning begins for county offices, just not the ones that we expected. The field is set for a special election for council on the city's west side, and political blowback from a principal's firing hits the Santa Barbara School Board. Our panel tonight, Bill McFadden, founder and publisher of NewsHawk. Kelsey Bruger, county reporter for The Independent. Political reporter Josh Molina, who writes for NewsHawk. And school board member Laura Capps. Thank you all for coming. And Bill, thank you for bringing your hawk to, uh, to balance off The Independent. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> That's it for him. Okay, good. All right, so you're a longtime Montecito resident. And I have enjoyed your column since the first evacuations in December, both for their arch tone and their source of uh, candid information about what the people on the ground are actually saying about authorities and how they've handled this situation. I want to read a quote from uh, your uh, column last weekend, and we'll put it up. Um, After an atmospheric river of hype, Santa Barbara County survived the latest storm of the century with very little drama, but a whole lot of inconvenience for tens of thousands of residents forced out of their homes in the umpteenth blanket mandatory evacuation of the year. With the horror of the deadly Montecito flash flooding and debris flow still fresh in everyone's mind and the fierce determination to just get through the rest of the rainy season with no more casualties, I can understand emergency management officials erring on the side of caution. But as soon as this immediate danger has passed this spring, it would behoove residents to have a come to Jesus meeting with elected officials and public safety policymakers about this one-size-fits-all response. Unless the law of gravity has been repealed, most of Montecito is in little danger from water or debris as a simple matter of topography, let alone physics. Tell us how you really feel, Bill. Has, uh, Who wrote that? I don't know. <laughs> so has the sheriff mishandled this whole evacuation issue since the beginning? That's an interesting topic. Um, the uh, the blanket mandatory evacuations are, are certainly um, suspect. Uh, the fact that the fire, wildfire evacuation maps were used for the first flood evacuation uh, or rainstorm evacuation maps on January 8th. Um, fire and, and water obviously behave, behave differently and I'm not sure that East Valley Road is, a, is an adequate cutoff for a flood racing down the mountain when it gets Apparently to not. Valley says, okay, can't go any farther. This is where the, the cutoff is. So um, I do think that's fair game for residents to question, um, when, especially when 19 of the 23 deaths were in the um, voluntary evacuation zone, including all six of the children. So, uh, so what's the mood of people? I mean, it's frustrating. They don't know what the future is about their property, uh, whether well, they can rebuild, not rebuild. There's a lot of frustration. and, and uh, in all fairness, no one really knows uh, what the future is for a lot of those properties. Um, the, the, the destruction is so catastrophic. Um, you know, the uh, whole creek beds have, have uh, shifted, um, and uh, there's there's really a lot of uncertainty. Nobody really knows what the what the terrain is going to be uh, like in the future. Nobody really knows um, uh, what the what the debris flow is going to be in the future. And there's, there's a number of questions regarding planning and development um, and you know, basic public safety. Um, we don't really know, but there is a lot of frustration. And I think um, I did not evacuate uh, for the flood um, on January 8th. And on January 9th, um, I was stunned when I'm going through my neighborhood at how many people were still there. I mean, people in their 80s and 90s were coming out of their houses and uh, the to a person, the, the response was because we were denied the ability to come back to our house for six days after the fire when everybody could see on the mountainside that there's nothing left to burn, there's no way it can turn back around, um, and yet we were, we were denied coming back. We were home for a week and then we were told to get out, and we just don't believe that they're going to allow us to come back in, and I, I think, you know, tragically, that was driving a lot of that, that defiance. And, 
again, I was just stunned at how many people were. My street, most everybody was there. Ribbon Rock, most everybody was there. Hot, Upper Hot Springs, most everybody was there. And what did you do this last time? I guess everybody had to leave. Um, well, of course, uh, I have yet to leave um, <laughs> because I'm contrary in that way. But, but in all honesty, our street is completely fine. Uh, topographically, um, there, is, there is no way that water or, or any kind of debris can reach, our, my, reach my house. We were flooded out in 1995 when we lived on Lower Montecito Creek, and um, when we sold that house, we looked specifically for terrain and, and geography, and, and uh, we were looking for uh, something high on a ridge line that were safe. So is it fair to point the finger at the sheriff, or, or well, is there a broader I, problem here? Well, I mean, I think by, by law, the sheriff, uh, the sheriff is the responsible party for the disaster exclusion zones. Um, he's the, the leadership of that. So I think it starts there, um, but uh, all of emergency management needs to, and, and I know that they will be reviewing this. Um, it's not like this is happening in a vacuum, but it, it sometimes seems that way. But I think it's fair to start at the top. I mean, you've got to take some responsibility there. And what do you mean when you say that residents should have a come to Jesus <clears throat> meeting with uh, elected officials in public safety? What, what does that look like? Well, I, I think that, again, getting back to the, the maps, um, just by saying from point A to point B, you've got to leave. Like, we don't want anybody in this area. Um, disregards the terrain, and 85% and of Montecito was unaffected by these floods, except by, for access. And I think that, um, you know, that's one of the things that, that those residents need to, to um, talk to emergency management officials about, you know, why do I have to leave when my, there's no way that my house is going to be affected? Um, I can get the access. You need to stay off the roads. Uh, first responders need to have uh, first priority. But, um, you know, there are ways to live with these, live within these disasters. Well, and it's just going to be a problem for, what, two to five years before the vegetation's back. Who knows? Can, I ask, can you do yeah. a house-by-house -house assessment, and who would do that? I mean, are the, is that the responsibility of... Are you, are you suggesting that's a responsibility of government or, or a, a, a it's homeowner? school board, I think. The school board. <laughs> it is a school board, but, you know, it's, it's Montecito Union, so. Uh, but um, I, I think that's, I, I don't really know yeah. because, um, you know, Montecito is sort of in a, in a non-governance kind of situation. You right. know, we're uh, part of the county, right. but we, we kind of fly under the radar. Um, we have a supervisor. We have our own planning commission. We have our own, you know, Montecito Association. There really is no place to go. I think what would be nice to have is something the equivalent of a, of a special congressional committee that has, you know, subpoena power and, and authority to actually get in there and actually and investigate and decide on a, on a course of action but you don't have that capability in, at the county level, to my knowledge. I have a question for you. Do you feel like, and do you think your neighbors felt like immediately after the disaster there was someone at the county who stepped up kind of to take on the face of we are the leader of this area? Because I've sort of heard mixed things, and I'm curious. Um, you know, it's, it's a weird line because you don't want to be grandstanding or... Right. Um, I, I mean, Doss Williams, levels. first county, first district supervisor. Yes, I mean there have been some people who've stepped up, and then others who have been just non-existent throughout this whole that this would whole be process. The mayor, you reference? Uh, well, I mean, you know, she's the mayor of Coast Village Road and Channel Drive, but she's not the mayor of Montecito. So, um, uh, you know, Doss Williams is the supervisor, but um, he's got a large district that you know ridiculously goes up to New Kuyama. So um, it, it's a, uh, again, Montecito is kind of in a, in a no man's land. Huh. I'm not s advocating at all that it should be its own city. I think that's a, that would be a disaster. But um, I, I, I do believe that there's got to be some kind of public-private um, commission or task force um, looking at these, at these issues and, and essentially coming up with a plan, like, you know, are, are these streets okay? Can, if you live below East Valley Road, do you need to, mm -hmm. you need to always yeah. have a bag packed? But if you're, if you're in these certain areas, um, you're safe. I think, I think that's the kind of, uh, uh, you know, circumstance that, that really calls out for, sure. for something like that. I just don't know who's gonna take on that as a responsibility. Right. Yeah. All right, well, years to go. Where that one gets resolved. So, Kelsey, 
Uh, the big uh, story in the county, political story, was supposed to be, of course, the race for second district supervisor. But as we all know, Greg Hart has a free route. So, but now there's a couple others, including the sheriff's race. Right. He's being challenged by two deputies. Is either one of them bringing on these kinds of issues that Bill raises here about evacuations and the handling of the disaster? No. Um, so two, the two lieutenants who are challenging him, Brian Olmstead and Eddie Shway, have, have not brought up Montecito or the evacuations. And I've asked both of them specifically what they thought about how that unfolded. And, um, you know, they said, uh, you know, in hindsight, it's easier. You know, they kind of danced around that, that question. Um, they have brought up other issues. The main thing that they bring up is morale in the department and the fact that um, more deputies um, and personnel leave the department, you know, faster than they can hire them. So there's always been a staffing issue at the department that leads to mandatory overtime, morale is down, and so um, uh, Lieutenant Brian Olmstead actually just won the endorsement of the Deputy Sheriff's Association, which was pretty significant because they haven't endorsed in 12 years. Hmm. And so 68% of uh, the union voted to endorse Olmstead, um, so that's pretty yeah, overwhelming. Sure you're a, you're <laughs> a world-class political analyst. Now, would you not agree with me that it's impossible for either one of those guys to oust Sheriff Bill Brown? You can't beat the champ unless they raise this specific yeah. issue, that nobody cares. Right from a voter perspective, whether morale is bad among the deputy sheriffs No one even not. really knows what that means is the first problem, but go on. Don't you agree with me on that, don't you, Josh? <laughs> well, yes, Jerry. No. I, uh, there has to be something that is so big, so huge, that the incumbent has been a part of that would tarnish them, that would give people a reason to want to oust them. Most people don't care, most voters, about morale or somebody's mm -hmm. policy decision regarding the jail or something like that. I think the problem is that they're not going to attack him on that because they, they feel like that's sort of, that would be a place that they went that would be very hard to come back from if they don't win. And I think there's a little bit of honor in the race. I get that sense. They want to support him. Um, well, as far as the well, evacuation issue. How do you go back after challenging? I mean, that's an honest question. I mean, I mean I, in, in any case. Right. I mean, well, you, last time, um, Sergeant Sandra Brown, no relation to Brown, was transferred from her position supervising the coroner's office to supervising the bailiffs in the courthouse. So oh. it was just called a routine transfer, but seen as a demotion um, after hmm. she went against the boss. Right. So. so uh, and then uh, we also have the... Uh, Auditor controllers race. Yeah, you wrote I think the, it's a bloodbath. I think <laughs> story that was that can more, only be described that way. <laughs> more read about an auditor controllers race than any in history, I believe, because right? it's a blood, blood, bloodbath. Now, Laura would like you to explain who's living with whom. Yeah. In that <laughs> I was confused. It's a little convoluted. Um, so. The, the big picture here that I think is important to keep in mind is this is all unfolding um, in the context of the $1.7 million embezzlement case in public works that came out last year. So because of that, I think there's a lot more accusations flying about what's happening in the auditor's office, auditor's, auditor's office because typically that race is a, you know, is a sleeper. So um, Jen Christensen, the, the race was Jen Christensen against Betty Schaefer. Jen Christensen, who's worked for the county for about 16 years, uh, served in the auditor's office herself, treasurer's office, and in county council, um, has brought up the fact that um, one of the vendors that the county uh, works with, um, Rick Schaefer, used to work for uh, used to work for the county. He went on, created his own business. Um, simpler systems that contracts with the county. He was married to Betsy Schaefer. Uh, they're, they're divorced. They divorced in 2013. Um, but this, 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 does, get, this, does, this does get complicated. <laughs> so, um, so, so Jen <laughs> Christensen is beefing about Betsy Schaefer's ex-husband. Yes. Yes, and so and uh, Theo Filati, who <laughs> is the current auditor, yes, he was Household living name. he he was living in Ventura when he was in the running to be appointed after Bob Guy stepped down. Yes, 
following me. And <laughs> so he rented a room from Rick Schaefer for a temporary from Betsy's ex husband. From, uh, from Betsy's ex husband, one of uh, a long time vendor. In order with the to county, spike his pension. In order to get this position, get a pension, you know, get a greater pension, get this promotion, um, and serve in this position for two years. So it is fair to say, okay, so so what? And Jen Christensen's point is this is just a little too cozy. Um, and I think larger picture, her argument is, why didn't the auditor's office catch this $1.7 million right. embezzlement case that happened over nine years? That and like a you, better question. If you really. ask... No, I think the question that's really <laughs> troubling... Is voluntary or mandatory? <laughs> <laughs> so was Betsy Schaefer married to her ex-husband at the time that the former auditor controller was living in the, in the room, it's in irrelevant. the rented room? Isn't it irrelevant? Uh, no. They uh, were divorced at <laughs> that time. It's a pension spike. The guy moved to, to spike his pension, right? I mean, that was the whole Well, he point. got this promotion, and it was at the time it was thought that, you know, Bob Guy stepped down two years before his term expired. It was thought that he was, you know, uh, Theo Filati <clears throat> would run for this seat this year, and he's not running. Um, and so Betsy Schaefer, who's his number two, has stepped in to run. Next Here week, we are. the Independent <laughs> presents a flow chart <laughs> of the auditor controllers. <laughs> All right. Aren't you, you going to ask her who's going to win, like the sheriff's race? Not tonight. Oh, yeah. Who's, who's the front runner? <laughs> Stay tuned, Josh. All right. Josh, speaking of who's going to win, <laughs> well, if we Josh, you, you, facts, you, you ran down the, uh, the, the third district's special election the much-needed special election. In I, I believe I'm the only reporter in town who's talked to all the candidates. Tyler Hayden. Did you finally reach the city college? You didn't, you didn't reach. She's skiing. Spring break? I, I, I have, talked to her mother. I, I talked to her mother, <laughs> yes. That's just as good. <laughs> Laura what brought her. What did her... What did her <laughs> what, are, what does her mother think? Does she think she's pretty good? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... As I understand your piece, uh, deconstructing. Investigative reporting. You believe <laughs> you believe that Oscar Gutierrez, our former director, it's his race to lose in the third district, and he's entirely capable of doing that. Is that a is that a fair characterization? Well, I think that you know typically in the, in a in a district race like this, if you have the party's endorsement, it's very helpful. He has a Democratic party. Democratic right? party, lots of resources. They're all Democrats who are running, but we don't really know how this is going to turn out because because it is a low turnout and the candidates are all pretty, shall we say, even. Um, you know, there there's there isn't anyone who stands out as like. Oh, they've been doing this in the community for 20 years, and they're the front runner. You know, Oscar getting the endorsement for the Democratic Party is a big boost from him. For him, it takes him from being kind of just a candidate to being a candidate who's going to have a legitimate shot now. And, and organizational resources, presumably. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not like oh, the Democratic Party has some great power. It just means resources. It means more people to walk and to call and to make phone banks. And who are the other candidates? And they'll they'll put him on the ballot right. or on the slate with all the other Democrats who they're really interested in. in. June, yeah. So that's tough for people to overcome who are not uh, part of that. So it's it's going to be an interesting race, but this is it's sort of the good and the bad about district elections, which is, you know, the, the, the good is that, you know, we've got three uh, people. We have Michael Vidal, we have Oscar Gutierrez, we have uh, Ken, Ken Rivas, Ken Rivas and uh, Elizabeth Hunter. So we have three Hispanic, three Mexican American candidates who are running. You know, and one of the points of and one woman and of district elections was to increase diversity on the council. So we have those candidates. We have Elizabeth Hunter, the only woman in the race who is running. So to that degree, it's it's working, uh, but we don't really know how good any of these candidates are. I've interviewed them, and they're they're they have a general understanding of the issues, so it's gonna take some time for them to come up to speed and hopefully we'll have some kind of forum and we can see these people lay out their, their policy issues. But Oscar, having being on that Democratic slate is going to be helpful to him. And the mayor behind him. Yeah, and having Kathy Murillo. Leading him around by the nose. <laughs> I think it's the phrase you're looking for. 
I mean, that's what it looked like to me. Oh, you weren't there at the women's political conference. I wasn't. And she was just, I mean, he was just following in her wake, and, and, and she was introducing him. Yeah, Kathy's doing everything she can to get him elected. Oscar was not even a registered Democrat up until the endorsement interview with the Democratic Party. So I interviewed him. I asked him, <clears throat> who told you to register as a Democrat? He wouldn't tell me. He said he didn't remember. He said that he was surprised that he wasn't a Democrat. He registered when he was 18. He was declined to state. All of a sudden, he registers. So he walks into the interview with the goal of getting endorsed. So um, that's kind of Because you can't get endorsed unless you're a registered Democrat. Yeah, it is sort of like insider stuff, but it goes to the larger narrative of, well, did they say, hey, you, why don't you become a Democrat? We'll endorse you. He says that's not the case, but Kathy clearly has been working on his behalf. Um, so, but it'd be good to get a seventh member, no matter who it is, somebody who can break some of those. He's such ties. a process guy, Josh. He loves that. So he does, doesn't he? <laughs> All right, Laura. So on March 13th, the school board voted in closed session to uphold the superintendent's recommendation to demote Mr. Barron's. Ed Reassign Barron. is the technical uh, yeah. way. Okay. Of, because uh, teaching, teaching is, is a good to, thing, yes, esteemed to, position. To can him as the principal of San Marcos High. <laughs> Uh, you were the only one who voted against that recommendation, four to one vote, yeah. and it has just uh, created a huge backlash. Have you, have you and your colleagues been surprised by the ferocity of the... Uh... The bloodbath. <laughs> <laughs> the bloodbath. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised. I, in a way, shouldn't have been because this, these group of parents that um, threw their support behind their principal were, were and are incredibly well organized. The fact that they had... 2,400 people signed a petition about a, a principal. It was a stunning. And um, really, you know, came in prior to the, the meeting and the vote with uh, these fact sheets of achievement at San Marcos High and just were, you know, a well-organized group of, of really caring and passionate and clear and cogent. And turned down 500 people for the meeting. 500 people for the meeting. Yeah, just incredible. So what did <laughs> they think was going to happen? after they voted against him, your colleagues, that is? Well, it's, it's I don't know, because we don't, you know, again, we don't have sort of these candid conversations because it's the Brown Act dictates pretty much everything we do. And so uh, there wasn't sort of that political um, calculation. I can speak for myself on, on my vote, um, and I imagine on theirs it wasn't, e there wasn't either. But that's but you, speculation. You were, you were hearing the community in a way that apparently others were not. You know, again, it's hard to, it's, this oh, is so tough. Oh, don't be modest. <laughs> um, I was, I can tell you, I, I can just speak for myself in this one, but I was extremely impressed with the arguments put forward by those who um, wanted to keep uh, Ed Barron's at the helm. Uh, not just these parents, but teachers that came forward and staff members that came forward and people that I've known for a long time. And, uh, you know, and then you look at the data and the, the school is, has done really well under his leadership. So um, that, amongst other things, influenced my vote. There's a lot to it, and that's the tough part with these personnel decisions and the fact that it's in closed session and all these things it makes it a very extremely frustrating uh, experience for people who are trying to um, weigh in and uh, be part of the democratic process. That's why I'm not surprised that there's a recall, because how frustrating is that, that you go to bat and you get all this momentum and, and then you participate in the process, yet you don't even know the rationale. Not, notwithstanding Kate Parker, who's been on the school, school board yeah. for a long time, yes. we have a relatively new superintendent in yeah. Kerry Matsuoka. So do you think that there's a, that he culturally just sort of misread how Santa Barbara's culture is in terms of the incredible Pol activism? The political culture community. The political activism. culture activism that we have in the sense that, you know, he recommends something to a largely appointed board he expects this to happen, and then all of a sudden, whoa, this is Santa Barbara. They come out in full force when they don't like something. Is that part of this at all? You know, that's a good question for him. I, I wouldn't be able to answer that with, with any kind of knowledge. I mean, we did see just months prior, you know, we had a tough vote of closing open alternative school, and we didn't have the amount of turnout but proportionally, we almost did in terms of the, the, the size of the school. So, you know, we had a couple hundred. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'd be surprised if he was surprised by that. I think that he understands. He's a quick read, mm -hmm. a quick glass, you know. But, and, uh, but again, that would be a good question for him. 
But so now we have a possible recall of two of your colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there are two seats on the November ballot. Yeah. Kate Parker, she's retiring. Yeah. Ismail uh, Aloha is going to run. He yes. told me anyway. He's yeah. going to run. So there's those two, and plus the uh, the two uh, recall seats. I mean, how do you think that's going to play out? Well, I just want to make sure it's clear. I, I am definitely not pleased with the outcome of this situation, but I am not at all supportive of the recall. I think that's a misuse of of energy and funds and all that. And we have an election coming up. That should be the focus. But um, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, we'll see what they do sort of. I think the next few weeks are critical to see if they can kind of, this momentum was strong and fierce, but if it translates into actually register, actually getting the money and getting, um, you know, the petition started, that, that remains to be seen. Well, and that's the irony is that now seeking to recall people who ran without opposition. In other words, you stepped up to run. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, I said this, I mean, I think that, you know, one potential plus is that people are caring about their school board, and I wish more people had run last time. I was looking forward to a campaign. A campaign, I believe, is, it teaches you how to be a good uh, elected official should you win. I mean, you have to go through the forums, you have to talk to reporters, you have to do the gatherings in people's um, in living well, rooms. Why did you say talk to reporters in such a dismissive <laughs> way? Why no, I, I know, in an educational she way. She always talks out. <laughs> did you yeah. have any problem with that? No. <laughs> good. All right. Well, thanks to tonight's panel, Bill McFadden, Kelsey Brueger, Josh Molina, and Laura Caps. And a quick programming note. Uh, as you heard earlier, Oscar uh, Gutierrez, a longtime technical director of Newsmakers, has decided to run for city council in the 3rd District. And because of this, Oscar and TV Santa Barbara management agreed with Newsmakers that in order to avoid any appearance of conflict of interest, we would bring on a new director. And we welcome tonight the indefatigable J.P. Montalvo. Uh, Oscar, we wish you well, and we want to know. We can't wait to. Uh, we want you to know that we can't wait to eviscerate you on future <laughs> editions of Newsmakers. Thanks for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, and our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of our past shows and special interviews. Thanks again to JP and to our crew, Ashe, Suzanne, Diane, Melissa, and Ken. And as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy senior executive producer, Hap Freund. We'll see you next time on Newsmaker.